Okay, let us remember what we have done. Now, remember, this is not going to be on the exam. You're not going to have a calculus-specific question on this exam. You will on the final exam. It will be based on this quantum mechanics work that we've been doing. So, what we have... Oh, I should mark record. Everyone's here now. It's not just you, Trace. <laughs> Disappointing. What we have done so far is we started with the time dependent Schrodinger equation. We separated it into a time dependent and a time independent Schrodinger equation. The purpose of the Schrodinger equation was to find the wave function, which is analogous to the electric field function for, um, for light. And that tells us things about the energy available and the probability of finding our particle. So this here is that time independent Schrodinger equation. It involved a second derivative. I had, because you don't have differential equations yet, how was that calculus test yesterday, gentlemen? It was, yeah, it was simpler. Yeah, now I was expecting. Simpler than you expected? Except for the last one. Yeah, <laughs> The first I was, I was fine with the last one. Yeah. I did the third problem twice because I'm like, no, I think I just put in a wrong number. I did it the second time, put in a wrong number, and then fix my error and got the same answer twice. So oh. I'm good on that. <laughs> okay, well, you don't have differential equations, so we had to tell you that psi had the form of e to the bx. And then you just plug it in and found what the conditions were for b. And then from those conditions for B and the boundary conditions, because we had three distinct regions, we looked at the boundaries and said that the, the wave function had to be continuous across the boundaries. Then we were getting it, then we got quantized values for B, only specific values for B. And from this relationship, that made us only specific values for energy. So we found only specific values for energy. And of course, we did all this work. We're not going to redo the work that we've done. Yes, all this work. And so we got to this here, and notice I just I changed the letter A to the letter L. What I had written there was correct, just it wasn't consistent with this picture that had it going from zero to L. So we had the wave functions, these upper things, are the wave functions that are telling us about the probability. Now, how do we find probability? from the wave function. And when I ask that question, think to the photon. How do we find the probability of a photon hitting a screen based on its electric field? Squared. We square it. Right? We said the electric field squared would tell us the probability, it tells us the intensity, which is the probability of a photon hitting that place. The higher the intensity, the higher the probability of the photon hitting. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to square this function to tell us the probability of our particle in this box being at different locations. So here's the wave functions graphed. If I square those, let's just start with the bottom one. If I square n equals 1 was the bottom one. If I square that function, what's it going to look like? Just use your hand. If we square this blue line. Okay, Nathan's waving his hands. And he waved them right at first. Now then he decided to get funny. It's going to be going like 0 squared 0, and then this is going to be going like that. And it's still got the sharp edge there. So it's going to go like that. So where would I expect the particle to be? Where's the most likely position to find it? Well, that, that is a true statement, but what specific location is most likely? Okay, the top of the hill, the middle. Both great answers. That's the place that it's most probable to be found. And using calculus, we could take this psi. Now, notice I have absolute values. We call this psi mod squared. But it's taking the square because of complex values that are possible. We have to use that symbol. So if I square this, 
I would have that is my function, right? And so if I take the derivative of this, and set it equal to zero, that would tell me where the most likely place is. So the derivative of this would be Something feels wrong about this because, I, well, no, that's okay. And so if I want to set this equal to zero, it's equal to zero if n pi x over l equals an integer multiple of pi or n pi x over l is equal to pi times m plus one half, right? Those are the values. I hope I did this math right. I was just doing it quickly off the fly, but we can mathematically find where they are. But it's much easier just to do what Nathan said at the peak of the hill. So that's for the n equals one state. What about n equals two? If I square the red line, what's it gonna look like? Pretty much, um, I'm gonna actually throw in a blank page. So if I do n equal, I'm gonna change back to red since after all n equals two was in red. n equals two, the sine mod squared is gonna go like, Like that. And actually now I think about it, it, it does have smoothing out the edge. My, my picture here should have actually not had the sharp edges. It should have gone. Like that. Uh, <laughs> well, now my blue line's not the right place, but she got something like that. Okay, so now where's the most likely place for it to be found? Top of one of the two. Where could it not be found? Yeah, it cannot be found here. And so we have a situation where the, the likelihood of finding it is greater in these two positions, and we can't find it all in the middle. Go ahead, Michael. So at the bottom one, is it close to zero? It's supposed to be at zero. That's, oh. that's my artistic okay. failure, right? Because it, it was crossing zero if you square zero of zero. So that, that's an artistic failure. Okay. Now, where is the... Where is the average position if I take a lot of measurements? Because it's symmetrical, it's going to be halfway in the middle. So the, the average position is right in the middle. But what's the probability of finding it there? Zero. So here's something interesting. It can not be at its most likely position. Well, not most likely, right? We have to use the right terms but it can't be at its average position. We have a name for that position. We call it the expectation value. If I take a lot of measurements and I take the average of them, that's what we call the expectation value. So it just means mean. And so the expectation value is at the center. But the probability of being at the center in the n equals two state is zero. It can't be there. Now here's the thing that really throws you for a loop. Let's say I make a measurement and I find that it's right here. Then I make another measurement. What do you think are the chances that it's gonna be right here? There are two answers, zero or finite. <laughs> it's not gonna be one for sure. You don't have a number to put on if it's not zero. 
So the question is, is it going to have no chance of being there, or does it have a chance of being there? Okay, we have here, has a chance. What do you say, Nate? Notice our twins here. Could be none, because it could be at the average. I don't know. Okay, be none because it can't be in the point between where we first measured here. What do you say, Michael? Uh, I agree with Nathan. Okay, Michael agrees with Nathan. What do you say, Chad? With which one? With that. Okay, well, the correct person was Trace. I would have agreed with the other three of you as well when I was taking <laughs> this class because it just makes sense. I found it here. It can't be here. So how could it ever get here? <laughs> the problem is I'm thinking of it as a particle. But what does quantum physics say it is? A wave. If it's a wave, the wave is filling the entire box. When I measure it, of course, it's to collapse to this position. But then when I go away, it's a wave again. It's filling the entire box. It has no probability of being here, but the wave can get past there. So there's a probability of being here. So it can move across that place, even though it's not allowed to be there, because the wave is filling the space. That's part of why quantum physics is confusing, right? So if we go to these other ones, like if I square the black one here, I would have, once again, my artistry is less than perfect. Right, this should be nice, perfectly smooth with all of them the same height. They have, have we tested these things? Have we tested these things? You know, that is a really, really good question. Right? I can sit here and I can tell you a bunch of stuff, and it could be untrue or it could be just theoretical and no one's ever tested it, and then it doesn't really have as much value. So have we tested it? Short answer is yes, but not exactly in this way. So we have a lot of things take as your practical example atoms. We use the same ideas with atoms to calculate what the energies are for the electrons in the atoms, which we will be talking, we have been talking about in class, and we will actually finish it up in class tomorrow, the, uh, the regular class. That is applying these principles to a different problem and seeing that these principles are giving us correct predictions. One of the things that's a little troubling about quantum mechanics is it's really not based on sound theory. It's based on some ideas that turned out to give us correct predictions. And so we believe it it's probably true because it's giving us lots and lots of correct predictions. The thing Nathan asked, has it been tested? It's not science if it hasn't been tested. But it's it's built on scientific ideas, you know, the, the idea of a particle could have a wave nature, but it's it's not firm footing as far as its background. But the testing indicates that it seems to be correct. Now Something like this, Has, have there been experiments like this? Okay, we can't simply do this, but they can come close to particle in a box type situations. By manipulating um, physical things, they can actually make it so an electron essentially can be in this region. And then they can measure, make measurements of the electron. And so they have confirmations to some extent of things very similar to this, you know, approaching the particle in the box. But it's always good to ask that question. It doesn't matter if it's physics, if it's history. You know, you should question and not just say, well, he's saying it, it must be true. Now some more fun things with quantum mechanics. We had already said that we have this normalization thing. Does anybody remember what... Okay, and Chad, you don't get to answer because, of course, you've had this drilled into you all semester. Does anyone remember what normalized meant? Yes. 
the sum of the probabilities of finding the particle If I check all possible positions and I add the probability for each position, what should it come to? One. Which was an integral that said integral of psi star psi. The star, once again, is because these can be complex. Dx equaled one. So that was the condition for normalization. The probability was psi squared, psi mod squared to be accurate. And since it's continuous, the way you add them up is integrating over all space. And so we used that when we were going through our work last week to determine that our wave function had that factor of square root 2 over L out front. So the probability of finding it in all space would be 1. But we have another thing, and that is the solutions must be orthogonal. And of course, Chad doesn't get to answer again. Orthogonal, is that a word that you have in your vocabulary? Yes. Yes. What does it mean in your vocabulary? Perpendicular. Okay, perpendicular. Excellent. Did you guys learn that in calculus? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you know what's going on here. Perpendicular is a two-dimensional word. So I can take these meter sticks. These two meter sticks are perpendicular. Or I could say they're mutually orthogonal. Each one is perpendicular to the other. If I take a third meter stick and I go like this, all of the meter sticks are mutually orthogonal. Right? That's a, it's a multi-dimensional, so it works here. Perpendicular is, is a two-dimensional word. Orthogonal is multi-dimensional. So I can have these three meter sticks all mutually orthogonal. What happens if I grab a fourth? It will overlap. And I'm not going to get it. That's because we live in a three-dimensional space. Quantum mechanics lives in an infinite dimensional space in this case. Infinite dimensional, how do I take my sticks? I take an infinite number of sticks and make them all mutually orthogonal, each stick perpendicular to each other stick. <laughs> Have fun. It's not something I can see in my head. It's not something I can visualize because it doesn't match my experience. You know, when I was in graduate school, we joked about one of our professors living in Hilbert space. It's the kind of space we're talking about here. Um, and we presumed that he might actually understand these ideas, these mathematical ideas of being mutually orthogonal in an infinite number of dimensions. But it's, it's a confusing idea. So, We'll point it out in analogies that you can understand. So in your calculus class, you've been working with unit vectors, you know, i, j, and k, I think. Is that what you've been using? Yeah. So those unit vectors, each one is mutually orthogonal to the other two. Right? So what that means, if they're mutually orthogonal, is I can uniquely describe any location as so much in this direction, so much in this direction, so much in this direction, right? Well, that's what we have here. We have an infinite space, but we can say we have so much in this solution, so much in this solution, so much in this solution, and it's unique. There's not two ways of getting the same state. So I start in a state like a wave on a string. A wave on a string, if I pluck it differently, it will have different frequencies at play. You have an infinite number of frequencies that could resonate on there. Right? It goes up to infinity. It's not continuous, but it's an infinite number. And whatever pattern, however you pluck it, you have so much of this frequency, so much of this, so much of this, so much of this, so much of this, so much of this. And each one of those is orthogonal. There's only one solution for how you can add them up to get that. So what does orthogonal mean mathematically now that we've tried to describe what it means in a spatial sort of sense? Mathematically, it means, well, if two vectors are orthogonal, their dot product has to be... That's a whiplash kind of question we're not supposed to ask. What's the dot product between two orthogonal vectors? Dot products are multiplying what parts? 
Dot products is multiplying parallel parts. So if I have two perpendicular vectors, what's the dot product going to be? Well, if I have perpendicular, how much is parallel? Zero. So the dot product is zero. So I dot J is always zero, right? So we do the same thing here, and it turns out that this integral is, in fact, how we do dot products. If I wanted to do psi dotted with psi, this is the integral I do. And so we have found an infinite number of solutions, right? We have n here, and n can be any positive integer. So that's an infinite number of solutions. But each of those has to be orthogonal. So I need to have psi sub m dot psi sub n is equal to 0. And so the way we do that is we do an integral psi sub m. And once again, that's star because they're actually complex values often, times psi sub n dx. So note that this one here, I really should have put n and n doing the same one. So psi n dot psi n has to be 1. And psi m dot psi n has to be 0 if m is not equal to n. So we combine these two equations using this. Notice it says Kronecker delta. That's mostly so I can remember the difference in a Dirac delta and a Kronecker delta. Kronecker is some dude's name. And what Kronecker delta means is delta with that's a way of writing the Greek letter D, delta. That's equal to 0 if m is not equal to n, and 1 if m equals n. It's a very simple idea. And so since I've been using it since roughly being your age, I'm like, everyone understands this, right? But of course, you've never seen that happen. Chad has, <laughs> because, well, like I said, I pity Chad because I keep using him as an example. <laughs> so it's very useful, and it allows us to combine those two equations into one simple equation, and we call it the orthonormal relationship because it is going to require orthogonality and it requires normalization. So it, both of those things are combined into one equation. So what if we wanted the time-dependent solution? We found here a time-independent solution, right? There is no time in this. But we had found right at the very beginning, I said, we never do this again because it's always the same that the solution for the time part is this. So if I want my time-dependent solution, I just multiply the two solutions together. The time-independent solution from the, for, with the time-dependent solution. So, oh, I did all my work there, so I guess I'll just go to where we are. And so my individual solutions, psi sub n of x and t is equal to v sub n of t psi sub n of x is equal to square root of 2 over L sine of n pi x over L e to the minus i e sub n t over h bar. So there is my time-dependent solution for energy state n. Notice that n does appear in the time time part because it's E sub n. It's the energy as it depends on n. And we determined that the energy is I'm doing a lot of back and forth. The energy is h bar squared pi squared over 2m l squared n squared. Is 
that right? Pi, oh no, pi is on top, two is on bottom. I was close. I'm going to do like I did before and move the n out. So the e sub n has to do with n, just like the we had it in the spatial portion. So that's my solution for any time if it's in state n. So what's that equation I have written in the middle of the slide? If this is my solution for the nth state. No, the, the one that's printed. Oh, it's in the middle. Well, I thought of that as middle. In, what's that equation then? You notice that psi is written differently. That's a capital psi versus lowercase size that I've been using. So psi x of t equals the sum. Yeah. Okay, C, X, C of n, C stands for constant. So you have a whole bunch of different constants. Okay. And then we have the psi of n. So we have the, the stuff that comes after the C sub n is what I've written in black. So what we're doing is we're saying the complete wave function is so much in the psi 1 state, so much in the psi 2 state, so much in the psi 3 state. And it's putting them all together to get one complete wave function. If I have that particle box, it's not going to be in probably the n equals 1 state or the n equals 2 state. It's going to be in some combination of them. And so this is finding the complete solution. This amount, if you take Cn squared, that tells you the probability of being in state n. So the CNs, those depend on how you set up the system. Going back to the wave on a string, if I pluck it at the center, that's going to set one set of CNs. If I pluck it at one quarter, it's going to set a completely different set of CNs. That's how I set up the system. That's what sets the CNs. So this is the complete solution. <laughs> How do I find the CNs? Well, here we use basically the idea, the idea of a Fourier transform. We know that we have our orthonormal condition. And so if I take the integral of psi sub n star, and then I multiply it by I better call that M, otherwise I'm going to have two N's in my equation that aren't the same thing. Okay, so that's what, I, that's what I've done up above. But we can evaluate this. Let's take the integrals over x. So everything that doesn't have an x can come out of the integral, right? Because if it's integral over x, anything that's constant doesn't affect the integral. It just stays a constant. So I'm going to rewrite this with constants out front. And then what remains? Is that. But what did we just say this is equal to? It's equal to zero unless? 
So we write that as delta mn, not mm. Delta mm would by definition be one. And so what that means is I'm going to have all of the summation, all the terms are zero except for when n is equal to m. And so I would have c sub m Now there's one thing I did here that I shouldn't have done. I have the time dependence here and there's no time dependence on, on this. This is assuming I'm taking the time independent, right? It has f of x, not f of x comma t. So I was supposed to do it without the time dependence. So I was supposed to do it <laughs> without this to follow what's up above. And if I take that out, then I just have c sub m. That's how we find them. You had a question. Why is it C sub M and not C sub N? Okay. It has to do with what I made my indices. Oh. Right? There, there's nothing special about N versus M. Yeah. And I had first put C sub N out front, and then I said, because I did my summation over N, I better change it. Oh. Had I been wiser thinking about the end result, I would have left my first N and changed the second one to M. Oh. And then I would have had C sub N equals C sub N. Because the goal is to be able to find these values. And so if I know what my states are, if I have something that is in a state like, well, a problem you're not going to have to do, but something that Chad's had to do, is let's say that we have a string and we pluck the string like this. So we plucked it at this point. We can make an equation if this is A, this is L, so put it like that. And this here is, let's say, H. We can make an equation to describe the line going from zero up to H at A and then back down to zero at the other end. And so that would be our F of X. So just, I mean, it's not something that's going to be beneficial to us here, but we'll do it. So we have two regions from zero to A and from A to L. And going from zero to A, it's just gonna be H X over A. X over A is the percentage of the way to A. And H is the height it will be there, so it's a simple line there. And then for the rest, it's going to be The slope on that one is going to be, I always have a harder time on this. It's not hard. I think it's this. H over A times 1 minus X. So if X equals A, nope. If X equals A, that would be 0, wouldn't it? Or no, no, it wouldn't. If x is equal to a, it needs to be h. Hmm. Okay, I, I totally, I can't, I don't feel like sitting here and thinking it through and it's not hard right you have to find the y-intercept up here and then the slope the slope is minus um h over I, i'm going to write this way first the slope is minus h over l minus a so we have that times x plus the y-intercept which is going to be that that's the long way of writing it. And then if you combine them, you would have
that. Okay. So the, those are the functions. You have one going from zero to A and one going from A to L. And then you would find the C sub Ns by doing the integral of psi one times the function that I just did. Going from zero to L, so you have to go zero to A with the first one, zero to or A to L with the second one. After you do that integral, you know what C sub n, sub one is, and then you repeat for n equals two and for n equals three and for n equals four, and you find out what all of your C sub n's are, and then you can make your complete function for starting with plucking that position in. It's a little drawn out. But we can do it, and then we, there we have our description of our complete state. Our complete state, we say, is in superposition. It's a superposition of the different states. You have so much percentage in state one, so much percentage in state two, so much percentage in state three, so much percentage in state four, et cetera. Um, Chad, do you have your, your um, quantum textbook? I just want to show them the pictures on the cover. Oh, great. Nice job of putting this sticker on. Amazon. Okay. I'm going to grab my textbook from my office just so you can see those pictures that Chad's in our series. So here's the picture on the front cover. It's a cat. It's a cat that's all happy and curious. Picture on the back cover. It's a cat. It's a dead cat. <laughs> yes, but it's not. So we have a live cat and a dead cat. The reason that the author, Griffiths, chose this picture is because it illustrates an explanation for how this works, how it can be in so much percentage of state one, so much percentage of state two, and so on. I've probably talked about it, but I'm going to do it again because it helps to put it in your brain to hear it again. So this is called the Schrodinger cat, or Schrodinger cat, or how do you want to pronounce his name? S-C-H-R-O-U-M-L-A-T-D. <laughs> I-N-G-E-R. Schrodinger, Schrodinger. I've had teachers pronounce both ways, and I just have looked it up, tried to learn to pronounce it again. So, people were discussing what it means if you are C1 times state 1 plus C2 times state 2 plus C3 times state 3. And some people say, well, it cannot simultaneously be in all of those states. It's got to be in just one of them. And other people are all, no, it's in all of them at the same time. So this is an explanation to help us understand that. So, did I talk about this in the general physics class? Or because I think you just mentioned him and then he has a formula. Okay. So they said, let's make this, this complicated thought experiment. No animals destroyed. I told, probably told that dumb joke to get wrong again. Um, so it's a thought experiment. No animals are harmed. Important that we don't get people on our tails for you know harming animals. Like cats have. Like cats have, yes. Yes, neighbor. Oh, I was Okay. Um so we imagine that we have a radioactive sample. Now what's going on with the radioactive sample? The nucleus is in an unstable state. That is, it's like I did in lab, I have this balance. It's kind of stable, but not completely knocked over. Gives off energy, in this case you heard the sound, when it falls to a lower energy state. Well, how does that occur? It's a quantum mechanics problem. One way of actually modeling the nucleus for an alpha decay is to say the nucleus is a, a sphere that is acting like that particle in a box problem except for it has finite walls instead of infinite. And you have these alpha particles that are bouncing back and forth in there. 
And every time the alpha particle gets to the edge of to the wall, it hits a barrier. It doesn't have enough energy to go over the barrier, right? If, if the barrier is 10 meters high and you're at 12 meters high, you just go right over, right? But if you're at five meters and it's a 10 meter barrier, you're not going over. So that's what we have. We have the alpha particles come to the barrier and each time they come to the barrier, they just bounce off because they can't get over it. Almost. And yeah, this is my last slide. I was thinking I was there, but I can always insert another. So the actual potential energy well looks something like this. So you have an alpha particle with an energy here that's bouncing back and forth. So this is energy in this direction. If it could get out here, it would be just fine. But it doesn't have enough energy to go up and over. Well, quantum physics says that the particle is a wave. And where's that wave? Well, the wave extends outside the box. And so the wave says that there is a probability of the particle being outside of the box. And if it's outside the box, it'll just keep going. And so every time that particle gets to the edge of the box, there is a certain probability that it will just go through, even though it doesn't have the energy to get over the wall. We call that tunneling. And so there's a tunneling probability, and that tunneling probability has to do with how thick that barrier is, what the distance is to get back to where you have enough energy, and how tall it is, how much energy violation you have. And so on the energy of the particle, we can calculate how many times per second it's going to get to the barrier, and we can calculate what the probability of it getting through the barrier is each time. And thus we can calculate that there is a certain amount of time at which you have a 50% probability that it will have tunneled out. That's where we get the half-life idea from. I mean, well, I, I said, I'm putting the don't cart before the horse here because, of course, the understanding of radioactivity came before understanding the probability and quantum physics aspects. But getting back to the Schrodinger cat problem then, we have this radioactive atom, a single atom, and so we know that at time equals zero, it's 100% in the undecayed state. And as time progresses, it's exponentially moving into the decayed state. So the amount that it's undecayed starts here, the amount that's decayed is zero. But over time, the amount that it's undecayed is dropping, the amount that's decayed is rising. So at the half-life, it's in a state, a superposition state is the word we use, where it's 50% undecayed state and 50% decayed state. And what this means is if I make a measurement, there's a 50% probability that I'll find this state, a 50% probability that I'll find this state. And so we want to take this and put it into something that's real life-ish. But we're only doing our minds. We're not killing cats. So we take this atom and we say, because we're doing it in our minds, we can make a 100% efficient detector that's going to detect that decay. Now, you guys saw in the lab that our detectors were nowhere close to 100%. But we're going to make a, a thought detector that's 100%. If it decays, it's going to measure the decay is an actual event. It's not a fuzzy thing. It's not like, oh, maybe, maybe not. So we measure that decay. And if it decays, we set up a trigger that's going to drop a hammer on a vial of cyanide. And we put a cap in the cage. We seal it up. And then we wait. So when we sealed it up, what state was the cat in? A lot. A lot. Now, as soon as that thing decays, what state is the cat going to be in? Dead. So what we can do is then we can transfer the quantum states of the nucleus of the atom to the state of the cat. So when I closed it, the cat was 100% alive, 100% probability alive, 0% probability of dead. And at the half-life time, it was 50% probability, 
fully alive, happy, purring. 50% dead as a doornail, rotten, and stinking. Now the question is, when does the cat die? Okay. Only when you look at it, when you look at it, you make a measurement, you force it to jump into one state. Just like we talked about the wave in the box, the wave is still in the box, but when you measure its position, you find just one position, so you force it into one state. So this cat is a certain percentage fully alive and a certain percentage dead as a doornail at any time after you close the box. And it will stay that in that superposition forever. Now, after a couple of years, it's going to be 99.99999% dead as a doornail. Then you have to have food. You have to get away a couple of years. And it's, you know, all those things. But it has a really small chance, a really small probability that it's fully alive and functioning. And quantum physics says it's both. And only when you open the door do you force it to be one or the other. And so as long as you never chuck in the cat, it'll live forever. That's, that's what these pictures are about. Something to help us understand what it means to be in superposition state, to be in multiple states at the same time. With that, we'll end for now. We'll go get some lunch and we'll come back and do some quantum physics and then have a test. What do y'all say? Do I have to show the quantum physics? No. Okay. Chad. Yes. Dad's got nothing better to do today. Pretty sure that's exactly how it feels. <laughs> uh, eating in the cafeteria. Praying for a good meal. <laughs> Last two meals have been less than stellar. Yeah. Oops. I gotta turn off the recording. I say it when I do that. Fire away. Oh, uh, so I know how to find eigen vectors, but then doing the second step. One of the I use what form does it I'm struggling to remember slash find. I don't know what I did here. I'm trying to figure out it. There we go.